So we're back. Welcome back. Our next session is by Matt Eland, and he's going to talk about how you can build your own AI sidekick with .NET 8, Semantic Kernel, and Azure AI. An AI sidekick, that is also a good yes. name for a, an AI assistant, right? I do like that yeah, one. Yeah, I really like that. Hi, Matt. Welcome. Hello, hello. I won't be talking about taking over the world or uh, whatever those scary uh, prompt uh, attacks that he was doing there, so uh, that's good. <laughs> I was going to say, let's keep this one positive, shall we? <laughs> so can you introduce yourself before we get started? Sure. Uh, I'm Matt Eland. I'm an AI specialist at a consultancy in Columbus, Ohio called Leading Edge, and I'm also a Microsoft MVP in AI. Wow. You're going to build an AI assistant with some cool technologies. Well, I'm trying to, for sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready for it? I'm ready for you. Okay, good luck. All right, uh, as I mentioned, I'm Matt Eland, or at Integerman on uh, Twitter. Um, and this is building your own AI sidekick with .NET 8, Semantic Kernel, and Azure AI. So I give a lot of talks on AI in the community, and one of the talks I've been giving this last year or so has been this ridiculous talk on automating my dog with Azure AI services. It's completely ridiculous. I have a stuffed dog with a webcam and a speaker, and I'm using Azure's speech-to-text, text-to-speech, uh, vision uh, analysis, image analysis, uh, language analytics, all these Azure AI uh, APIs to build a kind of this interactive experiment where you can interact with this large language model that thinks it's a dog. Um, and it's really just for teaching AI concepts and AI as a service to people. But I, I found that there was something there that was really interesting. And so this past year, I've been writing a book and every day was pretty much the same. I would write on the book and then go, go to bed <laughs> and do my day job as well. Uh, and I needed a little bit more variety. And so I decided, you know what, this, this talk I've been giving, I think there's a little bit more promise there. What if I took this whole concept and I started to make a personal AI assistant? And so I've been building something that I'm lovingly calling the Bat Computer because as we all know, uh, I am Batman. Uh, don't tell anyone. Uh, the authorities are still looking for me. Uh, but my goal with this was to use these same technologies, but instead of making a ridiculous thing that thinks it's a dog, I want to make something that could help me as my own personal AI assistant by integrating into the things that I'm doing on a daily basis, such as writing blog posts, preparing for conference talks like this one, uh, working on books and articles and things like that. And so I want to see what I can do to integrate an LLM into my daily workflows and external data. So uh, as you've all been immersed in LLMs or large language models for the last 13 months now, uh, they do have some limitations, right? We train our large language models on a, a set of, of source data, um, and then they kind of internalize that and the relationships in that, and then we can make prompts uh, to that model and it generates back completions, uh, whether in chat or just text completions. Uh, but the models don't do very well at live data, at things outside of themselves. So if you have new data past when the model was originally trained, it doesn't get that. And it's not really easy to make it go out and get external data. Now, there are some ways we can improve this, such as uh, if you're using Azure, you can use uh, Azure AI search and kind of interact with the chatbot built on your data. Um, so that's really effective. If you have like a knowledge base or something like that, I've trained it on my own blog posts and it works really well for that. Uh, and then if you work with something like Bing Chat, it uses retrieval augmentation generation or RAG to go out and pull in new data from external sources. And so that could be really helpful uh, if you're going to be asking it for specific things. And I thought, well, wait a minute, let's try to, to add RAG on top of what I've built here with this ridiculous demo app. And so my early vision for this application was I would have a kind of a modular system that has all these different uh, capabilities and I could add on to the capabilities over time. And when the user types in something or speaks to the application, uh, it's going to say, hey, which of my modules is best equipped to uh, interact with this? I was imagining maybe a regression model per uh, module and the mo it would uh, spit out a score saying, hey, how likely am I to be able to respond to this particular request? And in this case, it'd say, hey, the most likely one would be the weather API module would be able to handle will it rain? And then what I could do is I could build a prompt using prompt engineering. I could say, hey, I'm going to call it to my weather API. I'm going to get the current forecast. And then you get build a prompt and send it to a large language model. that says, the user just asked, and then the string that they asked. 
using the available data below, answer the question, and then there's details on the current weather conditions in my area. And so you send this off to LLM and you get a, a kind of a human-like uh, summary of the weather. And so that would meet that particular case. And this is a good example of uh, RAG. But this approach did have some limitations. I didn't even try to build on it. I noticed this, these limitations early on. And it would be like, what if there's a request that's complex enough that it needs multiple modules? So how does tomorrow's weather affect my current project? Are there any sessions tomorrow that might be affected by the weather? What hat should I wear for tomorrow's weather condition? Believe it or not, that's a, a very real concern for me with my bald head. Uh, so this is a case where no one particular module could answer this, but you could combine these uh, modules together to get the information you needed. And so this really uh, surfaced a need for AI orchestration. So AI orchestration is really the ability to go out and pull things from maybe multiple sources, multiple connectors, and sort of uh, mo uh, manage your, your whole AI over infrastructure, right? So really everything to the right of the model or including the model. And so I needed a way of, of orchestrating all these AI interactions with these, these different connectors, and I wanted to add more over time. And around then, I discovered uh, semantic uh, semantic kernel, which is Microsoft's uh, brand new open source project. Uh, they're actually uh, hitting uh, V1 uh, very, very, very soon here. They're at R RC3 right now. Um, but with semantic kernel, they basically have the idea of your, your AI model, so your large language model, whether that's you know, ChatGPT3 or something else, uh, your memory, such as uh, Azure AI Search, and then all these different capabilities that you might integrate into the model. And semantic kernel sits right in the middle and it kind of connects uh, your, your model to all the things that might need to answer the user's request, including like, your long-term memory and your search and things like that. So let's take a look at how uh, semantic kernel works. And I, I now have to pre uh, preface this with a disclaimer saying, I built these slides around uh, beta eight, uh, which was current as of early last week, but Microsoft has introduced some breaking changes since then. They are moving really fast on this project. So this code is pretty close to what's gonna be there, but it's not gonna be exact. And I'll, I'll highlight some key areas. But with semantic kernel, you're going out and you're creating a kernel and you're basically telling it what it can connect to. So here I'm saying, I want this kernel to connect to Azure OpenAI. Um, and I'm giving it my deployment name, I'm giving it an endpoint, I'm giving it a key, right? I can connect to, to uh, just OpenAI without Azure if I wanted to. I could also connect to like a local large language model using Llama Sharp or something else like that. So uh, the kernel uh, uh, architecture is very flexible. You can give it really whatever you want to work with. Uh, and I find that very, very helpful. Now, once you have your kernel, you can then define what they call a semantic function. This is really just kind of a templated function. So I can say, hey, respond to the user's request as if you were Batman, be creative and funny, uh, keep it clean, yada, yada, yada. And then I'm using a few shot inferencing here. So I'm giving it a couple examples. So here the user says, how are you? I'm fine. It's another wonderful day of inflicting vigilante justice upon the city. And so we were giving it a couple examples of how to interact. And then down here, I'm giving it this input variable saying, hey, this is what the user typed in this time. So this is just a, a template variable. And then AI colon, and I'm getting this giving this off to uh, the large language model and it's then going to be able to go out there and it's going to generate my completion. And so I'm passing this whole string in as my prompt template and giving it a description and a function name. This is gonna be relevant later when we talk about planners. And so I, had, I now have my bat function. And now I can take my kernel and I can take the user's message, which maybe might be something the user typed in or uh, something the user spoke or whatever it might be. I'm gonna tell the kernel to run my function and it's going to respond to what's the current date in the voice of Batman. And so Batman comes back with, the current date is relevant. I'm more concerned with stopping the Joker's latest key. So ridiculous, uh, but it also doesn't tell me the current date because a large language model doesn't know it. It wasn't trained on the current date. It doesn't have that information, even as trivial as that information is. So that's just highlighting a, a, a limitation of an LLM right there. So let's take this a step further. Let's create another function. So here I have an Alfred template. So if we have Batman, we now have his butler, Alfred. So it says, hey, I want you to summarize things in the personality of Alfred. Uh, and it gives it a couple of examples as well. And we create the function. And now we can take the user's text uh, and, and basically we're gonna take whatever the user typed in, what's the current date. We're gonna pipe it into the bat function. So Batman's gonna <laughs> react to that. Then we're gonna take that response and pipe it into the Alfred's function. So whatever Batman comes out with, it's gonna go over to Alfred and then that's gonna be what the user interacts with. So here we get the current date is relevant. 
And then that gets sent over to Alfred. It says, ah, the Joker's latest scheme, always a cause for concern, yada, yada, yada. So we see we can kind of chain together these functions, almost like a little bit of functional programming. If you have a, a software engineering uh, background, you're we're really composing functions of um, smaller functions. So that's not particularly um, useful. It is interesting, uh, but it's not particularly useful for getting data into things. So let's look at how we do that. Now, we call these native functions or plugins in Semantic Kernel. And they're basically just C-sharp classes. You can do this also in Python and Java, by the way. Uh, but they're just a C-sharp class. Uh, and here I have a, a function here, or a method that says, hey, I want to get the current date. And here's another one that gets the current time. And these are both now functions that I can register into my kernel that can be called in as far as, as um, resolving a user's request. Um, we call import functions. The process for this is a little bit different now because <laughs> uh, they're moving really fast. Uh, but we're registering the functions, including our bat function and our Alfred function. And when we register a function into our kernel, that lets the planner know that it's there. So let's talk about this, this idea of a planner because this is what really sells semantic kernel for me. So the idea of a planner is it's something that can fulfill the user's request. So the earliest planner, well, we'll talk about that in a second. The, the, the idea of a planner is, hey, I've got these actions which might be able to fulfill the request, and I've got a goal that I'm trying to do, such as what's the current date. And a planner says, what plan can I create that's going to fulfill this in the best way based on what I can do? And so a simple plan might be, uh, to, I'm just going to call the get current date. So what's the current date? It's going to come out with December 12th. No other text, just December 12th. A more complex plan might be to get the current date and then pipe it to the Alfred function. And then I can say, what's the current date? And I get, ah, so the current date is December 12th. Um, and so that's sort of the idea of a planner. It's a very simple example. Uh, a more complex example, which is one of the more, uh, <laughs> one of the more capable examples uh, in my application right now, is I can ask it, what hat should I wear tomorrow? And in order to answer that, hat, that question, it has to know my current location. So it's got to have a get location function, which you can use GPS, or I actually have mine hard coded right now to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and then it's going to call it to get the weather forecast for that area. And then it also needs to know what hats I have. So it's got to query my, my database or document for that. And it also has to understand my clothing preferences. So when I prefer to wear what. And then taking all this information, it can generate a, a response using uh, a large language model. Right. And so you get all these things together. It says, hey, Matt, given tomorrow's conditions, I suggest you wear your wool ivy hat, that kind of thing. Right. So that's the idea of a planner. And this is where semantic kernel really shines because you give it these capabilities and it arranges these capabilities to handle the user's questions in a very almost intelligent way. You know, all these things aren't intelligent. They're just statistics, but it seems intelligent, which is nice. Hence artificial intelligence. So uh, the earliest uh, planner that Microsoft published was called the Action Planner. And all this does is it says, hey, here's, the, here's my goal. Which one action can I take that's going to give me the best result? And so it's only going to select one. So what's the current date? It's probably going to select get current date. And I want you to think for a second of how you would implement this if you were building this as a programmer. And I, when I looked at this, I was, I was very, like, how does that work? And then I dug into it, and it's, it's hilarious. What it actually does is it generates a prompt. It generates a large language model prompt that says, hey, you must pick an action to fill the user's request. Here's the user's prompt. Here are your options. Here's what each one does. And what it does is just lists out the functions that you've registered into your kernel, uh, the name of it, and then the description you provided. And it says, hey, what, what's the name of the one function I should call? And, and then it sends that off to uh, uh, to chat GPT or whatever large language model it's configured to talk to, and it gets back, oh, you should talk to the get current date uh, function. And when you do that, you're going to get back Saturday, December 12th, uh, 2nd, uh, which was the current date at the time I made the slide. Uh, so here's the code for this. The code does change uh, a little bit uh, in the more recent versions. But here we're creating an action planner. We're calling it, hey, create my plan. I'm going to invoke my plan. But here's the goal I'm trying to, to fulfill. And then I'm just uh, outputting that. Now, this doesn't work very well with more complex things. So what's the current date and time? Or uh, tell me the current date in the voice of Batman. You know, it can only pick one function. So it has a, uh, a limitation there. So we move on to the next version. Uh, Microsoft introduces the sequential planner, which is this 
it's almost like a waterfall plan generator. It generates a comprehensive, in order to fulfill this request, I need to do, I need to call, call get current date, send the date to Batman, send Batman's response to Alfred, send Alfred's response to the user, do these four things together in this order and it will fulfill the user's request. So uh, in project management terms, this would be waterfall or we're building a giant plan that's going to be perfect and work fine. And this is great as long as the plan is perfect and works fine. But if it doesn't, then well, it, it all falls apart. Uh, but the way this works is instead of creating an action planner, you're now creating a sequential planner. You're still calling create plan async. So here have Alfred tell me the current time and we invoke our plan. Very similar code to what we saw before. And we get back uh, greetings. I'm pleased to inform you the current time is, you know, that was the current time at the time I made the slide. Uh, and it does this by calling get to current time and it pipes that into Alfred. So how does this work? Well, it works very similar to how the action planner worked in that it generates a plan and then it sends it off to, or, well, it says, hey, here are your capabilities, build me a plan. But what's different about this one is it says, hey, I want you to output the plan in JSON. Here's the schema that I want you to use. And, and please, large language model, generate a valid JSON schema that works fine for me and doesn't have any issues. Um, and this is where this kind of falls apart because this doesn't scale very well past a certain number of inputs. And even when it looks like it works, sometimes you'll get variables in your uh, in your outputs. Um, and it's, it's generally kind of a disappointing uh, thing, just like, <laughs> just like waterfall project management was for software engineers. Uh, and so if that was waterfall, well, now there's stepwise planner, which is really kind of agile. So instead of having a big plan up front, we're going to do things very iteratively. So here we have our goal, we have our actions, and what it's going to do, it's going to try to find the individual actions to take in sequence that, that meet our needs. The code for this, very similar. We have a stepwise planner, uh, and then we're calling create plan, not create plan async. The APIs are slightly different for all the planners, uh, but we're calling create plan, we're invoking our plan, and we're getting our value back. Now, an example here for tell B uh, Batman the current time and have Alfred summarize his response, it's gonna say, hey, large language model is the first step I should take given the capabilities I have. It's like, oh, I should call get time. Oh, to tell Batman the current time, I should use this function. Um, this is actually the thoughts of the model. Uh, there's a phenomenon in, in, in prompt engineering where if you ask your, your LLM to summarize why it's doing what it's doing, you get bit more accurate results. So you actually get back the, the thoughts of the model as it's generating things, which is interesting. Okay. And so it says, okay, I've gotten the time. Am I done with the user's request? Uh, no, I haven't really told Batman anything. Okay, so now I'm going to go out and I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to call my Batman function. All right, well, now that I've told that and I've gotten back Batman's summer response to that, am I done? Well, no, I haven't really called Alfred, so I'm going to do that next. And each one of these things, it's making a request out to your large language model. Say, hey, here's my current capabilities. Here's my current state. Am I done? If not, what do I do next? And as you can imagine, this actually does rack up a decent amount of uh, token usage, right? So you're making a very simple request. You're getting a good response generally, but you're using a whole lot of tokens generating completions because you're trying a lot of different plans and you're talking to the LLM a lot. I've also noticed that this doesn't quite scale as well as I want. So as we move to our close here, let's talk about scalability and the scalability concerns I have with uh, Semantic Kernel and how Microsoft is addressing them. So what starts out fine with like just a few functions, uh, as soon as you add in more, well, that's more information that's going to the LLM every request. And it's more opportunities for it to hallucinate, get confused, um, just mistake the intent of a function. And so, Uh, every time you add a new function, it, it feels like things are just going to uh, get a little bit more uh, chaotic and less reliable. So Microsoft is addressing this uh, by adding a couple new planners here. So they added a handlebars planner uh, that uses a handlebars template, and this is now their kind of recommended default planner. Uh, they also added a function calling stepwise planner that is sort of the next evolution of stepwise planner. It's said to be able to handle two to three times the scale uh, of the number of functions that it could before. Um, this is also a very experimental one, so they may take the function calling stepwise planner away. Uh, they have uh, introduced a new guide for migrating planners. They introduced this Sunday. Um, 
And so this is really good to follow if you're trying to migrate from the code I'm showing here to the newer recommended code. Uh, but their recommendation on scalability is that they want you to only send a certain subset of functions to your planner and say like, hey, we think that your planner should only consider these particular functions and that's gonna help you with your scalability concerns. And this is actually kind of getting back to my original vision for my back computer of what capabilities are gonna be most relevant. So I think you still support this maybe with a classification model that's gonna help you out with some things. Uh, as we close, just wanna talk a little bit about memory and knowledge. So uh, with memory, uh, you can, it uses text embeddings. Uh, so you give it a string such as I am the Batman and it's gonna generate like a vector uh, of that just uh, using the standard text embeddings approach. Uh, and you can kind of store that in your memory. And so later on, if I ask it, uh, who am I? It's gonna generate the vector for that and it's gonna kind of compare the two of them and it's gonna say, well, based on the facts I know, that looks very similar to my I am the Batman uh, fact that I know. It's kind of a ridiculous example there, but a less ridiculous example would be uh, maybe crawling a document and storing the results of that uh, in there. So you can see in a, an example of this where maybe we are going out and we're looking at a set of uh, RSS feeds or websites or APIs, and we're periodically calling these things out, maybe summarizing them with Azure AI services, uh, and then storing the results in our knowledge store. So this is where I'm trying to take this application. I'm trying to build this to, to a point where I can have it automatically look at, at documents that are relevant for me, maybe point out some things uh, that are interesting to me, um, be basically a research assistant and a uh, schedule organizer for me. Um, that's sort of the idea of, of this whole thing. So I'm not gonna talk too much more about my plans there, but let's talk more about how you can learn a little bit more. If you're interested, uh, I just published an article recently on introducing semantic kernel on C Sharp. This is built on the .NET, A or sort of the, uh, the, the uh, beta eight version of this, uh, but I will be uh, pushing some new content out hopefully in the next month that talk uh, about the differences with the V1 or the, the actual initial release. Uh, I'll also be delivering a workshop on this uh, with my friend Sam. Uh, in January uh, at Sandusky, Ohio at the Code Bash conference. So uh, I, I encourage you to check that out if you are uh, at all interested. And uh, uh, I managed to get this included in my next book. So we'll have a chapter on a semantic kernel as well in data science on data. So thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please hit me up on Discord or Twitter. Uh, but uh, thanks to the conference for having me. And uh, hopefully this was educational and semi-entertaining as well. <laughs> we really appreciate it, Matt. That was a brilliant talk. I like the Batman um, stance on it. I actually think it really helped explain what was going on. So <laughs> I, um, that was a really, really good session. Thank you for taking us through all the different changes, how we've got to where we are. And like you said, it's not a, like it's been just over a year, has it? And we've had that many, you know, improvements technically. You know, you were saying it doesn't scale and here's the recommendation. It's, it's a neat story. Yeah, and Microsoft's really investing a lot in this. It's all open source and it is moving at breakneck speed. They have their own Discord and it's it's crazy. They're having office hours twice a week. It's, it's amazing. Wow, no, that's really, really great. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much for sharing it with us. You sure. mentioned it was open source, so it's just go straight to the the GitHub. Is it a, is it a good open source, like good good resource to go and kind of get started and learn? Absolutely, I'll put a link to that in Discord. Wonderful, oh, great. thank you. Yeah. That would be good. People can kind of get started. Yeah. Any any questions from your no, side? No, no, not from my side. Wonderful. No. Um, the I guess the only other piece of it is you mentioned your book. Um, you mentioned some of this is going to be in it. Uh, can you sh can you share a date? Do you have a date of when people will be able to get hold of that? We expect that to be out by Halloween of 2024. Nice. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Is is the date specifically Halloween? That's so funny. <laughs> is it that dramatic? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is actually yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. We should always use those types of others to be like, yeah, this is a scary book, but it's, um, I'm sure it'll be. I'm sure it won't be. I'm sure it'll be an absolute treat for everyone. Um, and Matt, do you have any other Batman inspired talks? I mean, the dog one at the start, I was quite appreciating. I feel like I need to go find that in the relics, maybe. Oh, no, I, I talk a lot about Die Hard and being a Christmas movie and how machine learning proves that. But I think next year I'll be talking more about the, the Bat computer. Oh, I like okay. that. Okay, yeah. so we might get a sort of a second season of the, the, bat, the bat theme. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, I know I, I love it when sessions take things outside the box. I think it's another way to explain what is complex and fast moving technology by breaking it down into something that you do know and then something new, isn't it, in mm -hmm. some senses? And what, what I do know is, is Batman. There yeah. we go. <laughs> That's already a good start. It's a good start, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. For those who don't know Batman, um, might have been a bit more difficult, but that's okay. <laughs> you think people don't know Batman? Uh, who knows? You never who knows? know. You never know. know. Yep. Anyway, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yes. Do pop into that community channel uh, on Discord, have a chat with people, share all of your great information, uh, and hopefully we'll have you again on the, the AI, Global AI community. And good luck yeah, with your well, book. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay. All right. See you later. Bye bye. Amazing. So another great session that was kind of felt a little more end to end. We had semantic kernel. We had um, bringing in the different models. When do we call the LLMs? Um, and so, yeah, a really nice way to put all of what we know together. So with that, let's go to a little break and then we'll be on to our next session. Have you ever been woken up by a great generative AI product idea? Then you go to your computer and realize you have no idea where to start. Well, you're in luck. We just released our Generative AI for Beginners course, which is 12 lessons on teaching everything you need to know to build Generative AI applications. Go to the link here to start building and start learning. <clears throat> Witnessing the shift of generative AI from a niche technology in the hands of a few to an accessible technology businesses are harnessing to benefit the many. Now you can tap into this opportunity to gain an AI advantage, get to market fast, do it right, and do so responsibly, safely, and securely. Copilots are becoming an AI category in and of themselves, and today you can build custom copilots to serve the exact needs of your customers and employees. Bringing content generation to all kinds of apps to supercharge creativity. Designing contextual experiences that impress and captivate. And freeing people to focus on their highest value work. This is Azure AI Studio the place to build your co-pilots, where you can confidently apply the latest state-of-the-art and open source models. Easily ground responses in your data, knowing privacy is protected. Deliver multimodal interactions beyond text alone that feel more natural. And build on a foundation of trust through every step of app development. The possibilities with AI are limitless. Build your own co-pilots with Azure AI. Let's do generative AI right together.